If we want to talk about changing the way that people move and the way that we move goods, we need to look at the carbon impact, but at the same time we need to look at other issues like road safety, air pollution and congestion. So what we have learned is that you cannot address one without addressing the other at the same time. So this is why we ended up with the phrase sustainable low carbon transport. And in practical terms, when you look at a city, what, what, what does this mean? More bikes? More, um, more buses? It in includes a number of things. First, it includes land use planning, so how can we reduce the need for, uh, for individual travel? It means public transport, it means uh, bikes as well, but it also means freight systems. So, and we should not only look at the cities, we should also look at what's happening between the cities. So then we talk about rail, we talk about inland water transport, so it's, it's really a combination of, of, of solutions. Yeah. Okay, Michael, you're based in Shanghai. Uh, I'm in Washington. You're in Washington. I'm terribly sorry. Corny's based in Shanghai. Well, Washington's interesting anyway. In terms of the um, American transport system, people often talk about it being car heavy, um, car heavy, bus light, and not many bicycles in between. What, what do you think we can learn from, from the USA, and what, what challenges do you think the USA faces in terms of developing a, a more effective, sustainable transport system? Well, I. About 30 years ago, I founded the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy because we saw the need as Americans to reform the kinds of transportation that we were exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, indeed, America has learned a lot of lessons in those 30 years, and now in cities and states across the country, we find leadership emerging that's working to create smarter growth, more compact cities, with mixed land uses so people can walk and ride bicycles and take public transportation for more of their trips. And we're working on developing a much greener freight and logistics system. And there are things that other countries can learn from both our successes and our mistakes in avoiding the excessive automobile dependence and sprawl development that America has embraced and which is now at a great expense working to move back from. We can look at successes in Europe, in Asia, where very wealthy economies have emerged that are much less dependent on cars, and where bankers and politicians ride the subway, ride the bus, walk, take their bicycle, and that's indeed seen as a healthy choice. So America is now beginning to embrace those healthy choices, and. Uh, the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport and all of its members are working to help promote those healthy transportation systems and choices worldwide. You're, you're fighting against a, uh, a fearsome foe because I guess America was in a sense built on the automobile and you, you think about how governments measure their success. So often you hear about the number of cars that have been sold or the strength of certain industries. Um, we're talking about something far greater than just working out how many more buses we can put on the roads, aren't we? We are, and we're working about how to develop a new economy. And if we look at you know, what, it, what kind of jobs are produced by the car-dependent economy, it actually produces fewer jobs than a green, sustainable transportation economy. When we look at economist studies of what happens if you spend a billion dollars building new public transportation, it creates many more jobs than a billion dollars spent building more highways. So we're seeing in the creation of these new sustainable transport industries a new hope for economic revival and for a more equitable and just access to goods, services, and, and basic human needs. We see sustainable transportation as indeed imperative to creating sustainable development and eliminating extreme poverty. Corny, let's get your views on this because um, based in Shanghai, I think you probably got some fascinating insights into how uh, a country which is growing very, very fast is trying to really develop an effective transport system because we know that um, big cities in China are suffering severe pollution problems. Give us a sense about how the Chinese are trying to address these issues. I think what we see in China is very rapid economic growth, but what we see in the city of Shanghai where I live that they made a very clear decision 15 years ago, and they say, we're going to de-link economic growth from the growth in the number of vehicles. So what we see in Shanghai is that you cannot just go and buy a car. First, you need to get a permit to own the car. So as a consequence, 
we only have eight or 9,000 new cars entering the fleet each month. And based on that, congestion in a city like Shanghai is much less than in Beijing. So we see that the Chinese are actually taking a lot of measures. They have started, Shanghai has built 500 kilometers of subway in 15 years. Uh, China has built uh, something like 12,000 kilometers of high-speed rail within a period also of three or four years. China, the cities in China have very quickly introduced cleaner fuels and cleaner vehicles. So what we like to say is that there are no countries, there's no country which has really more serious challenges than China, but there's also, there are very few countries who take their challenges as serious as China is doing. So, so in that sense, I, do, I have a certain sense of optimism with respect to the situation in China. Maybe what we can also talk about is a little bit is that why we are here in, uh, in, in, in Warsaw, that in the negotiations, they are talking about what the world should be doing. What we are working on in our partnership is actually what the world is already doing. And we see that countries like China, even countries like the US or, or here in Europe, a lot of action is being taken. So this is what we will be discussing tomorrow at a transport day, where we are bringing together 250 people, 250 experts, to, to, to develop recommendations to the negotiators and say, like, what is it that can be done to accelerate what's already happening in the outside world? This is also something that we just came from a meeting with staff from the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who is organizing a climate summit for world leaders next year. And again, we want to talk about, to the world leaders about what they can do to accelerate these kind of promising new starts that we see everywhere in the world. And last thing is that you talked about fighting a big enemy like the cars in the US. It's very interesting, like also in the US, the younger generation is actually driving less. In a city like Stuttgart, we see that here in Germany, we see that the number of young people who have a driver's license has decreased by about 30 to 40 percent over the last five years. So the younger generation has decided that the old mobility model of people like us is no longer what they would like to see. So, and if you have the youth, you have the future.